Welcome, everybody, to uh, my lecture for the IAFNR 2022 conference. I'm really excited to have you here, hoping that this will be a great experience for everyone. My uh, talk this year is Stacking Neuroplasticity to Downregulate Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. Uh, my name is Sherrick Peck. I'm a physical therapist by profession with a master's degree in counseling. Um, I'm also the inventor of the Resimax, a cool little haptic neurologic feedback device that uh, many of you are familiar with. You'll notice that many of the uh, cautionary signs that are out in the world are uh, designed with bold red, yellow, uh, exclamation points, and they're, you know, or bear. I guess you could have a bear. And sometimes these are just um, designed to grab people's attention, right? There are certain markers in our nervous system that, that, or certain things that happen in the world and certain colors that really light up our senses that uh, get us prepared for fight or flight or fleeing or running or freezing. Um, so we're going to go through quite a bit of things in that arena. A brief description of our uh, presentation. I want to talk about stacking cognitive behavioral therapies or the best components of those therapies with functional neurology concepts and techniques and show how physiology can help us rewire trauma, trauma ideation, and key psychological and physiologic loops created during stressful or traumatic experiences. There's a lot like, uh, like our little stack toy there from uh, Fisher Price. It's just one thing on top of another on top of another. And pretty quick, we can actually use those concepts to uh, safely help a person rewire their central nervous system from traumatic experiences that they've had. This lecture intends to help the practitioner safely assist neurologic reprogramming of the stress response and enhance healing without crossing professional barriers or creating a quote unquote, counseling relationship with the client. Those are very important concepts. A few key presentation points, brief overview of the neurologic, psychological, and physiologic responses to stress. We'll give an overview of uh, cognitive behavioral therapies and other psychologic approaches to treatment and look at functional neurologic therapies and functional activities that can help us break up the trauma chemicals and the hardwiring of the uh, neurologic and physiologic trauma response. Um, we'll also go through an overview of techniques to help you rewire the neurologic pathways. And I hope it's a lot of fun along the way. So let's talk first about that fight, flight, freeze response, the tachycardia, the anxiousness, um, the increase in blood pressure, the pell, the flushed, or maybe it's both, or maybe it's alternating or the pupils dilating, the perspiration, uterine contraction, tremors, uh, increased blood glucose levels, incre increased corticotropin and cortisol levels, increased epinephrine, norepinephrine, and blood, blood clotting factors, all of those designed to keep you alive going through a very stressful time, right? This is what it looks like. Yeah. Um, there are some really interesting things about the emotions and how they're tied to cranial nerves that I want to make sure we go over. Um, the trigeminal nerve, for example, has a very strong component in that uh, sympathetic response, especially certain branches of that trigeminal system. Let's show what that looks like. Very much facial expression, facial nerves, the clenching of the jaw, you know, all of that stuff has a very strong trigeminal and facial nerve component to it, doesn't it? And uh, of course, that's in complete uh, opposition to our uh, gentle little smile. So from an outward view, here's what we're looking at. The teeth clench, the eyes open wide, the nostrils flare, uh, we hold or catch our breath, we protrude the jaw. There's a pale or flushing or that alternating. Um, forward head, spinal extension, the eyes, you know, again, everything is getting ready for us to be able to see what's happening around us and what's coming at us. Um, sternocleidomastoid engagement, you know, that, that muscle just pops out really big. Large muscles tense, the cervical muscles become rigid. And there's a shutdown of the bowel and digestive system. 
this is really a cortisol flood, and it's a, it's an important concept for people to understand who have that fight or flight system turned on and don't know how to turn it off. That's what it looks like. I'm borrowing a couple of slides here from our friend Dr. Ryan Cedarmark, um, but this is important for you to remember when we're talking about trauma and trauma ideation. There are two real key areas of the nervous system that can help tame that sympathetic tone. Number one, your prefrontal cortex. It shuts off in the fight or flight stress response, or it shuts down tremendously, right? And um, you might remember sometimes we call that amygdala hijacking. But the vagus nerve plays a crucial role in keeping those systems and the prefrontal cortex up online. And it's really about balance. I mean, maybe that is an oversimplification, but um, there's really a, a balance or a homeostasis that is extremely important. Those of us who have suffered um, brain injuries oftentimes have a hard time getting that balance back under control. There's another way to look at it. Um, we have a teeter-totter between cranial nerve number five and cranial nerve number 10. When one's up, the other can't function. And when one is, is doing real well, the other is at rest. One of the uh, coolest processes that I want to remind you about is that breathing, while it happens automatically, it can come under voluntary control, and that makes it a prime candidate for inter interventions. Then, of course, we've got to talk about some of the existing treatments. I'm a little bit saddened by uh, how how much the SSRI therapies are are in use, and um, according to uh, to several sources, twenty to thirty percent effective. That's not very effective, and yet. You know, that's the very first therapy that uh, that we throw at people who have been through trauma. And about 13.2% 13 of adults in the U.S. are are on these SSRI therapies. And uh, a good friend pointed out, it's not really that people don't have enough serotonin or enough quality serotonin. The problem really goes back before that. It's a GABA problem. They're not uh, getting the building blocks in there to uh, make sure that, that the nervous system knows how to calm itself down. So I want to talk about a couple of different uh, therapies. Number one, we'll start with EMDR. Um, those of you who are familiar with that know that it's, you know, moving the eyes back and forth and, and uh, doing certain timing, certain tapping, certain movements. Um, the uh, the goal and uh, and um, hope, I guess, is to involve the behavioral, cognitive, emotional, and physical um, all together, and combine those with some eye movements that will affect the brain and assist in healing. It uh, targets the amygdala and the hippocampus, trying to get that um, ancient part of the brain to calm itself down a little bit better. It may not be a good option for those who are extremely overwhelmed or shut down when feeling an emotion. And it's not a great option for those who are living in the, uh, in the moment of trauma right now. Um, it is considered fairly highly efficacious in reducing PTSD symptoms, according to um, several authors. Um, about 36 to 95 percent effective. And it does require a mental health license. Now that range um, is is unique. That's that's it's kind of all over the map. So hopefully, if you go in or send your patients in for this therapy, you uh, make sure that you find one of those that that has high effective ranges. I guess key components of cognitive be behavioral therapies, um, cognitive processing therapies. We're going to look at the functional analysis of the behavioral um, behavior problems, cognitive monitoring and restructuring, emotion regulation training, problem solving training. There's a lot of um, education geared at helping an individual understand what the thoughts are, 
that they're just, you know, tied to feelings, tied to things and, and kind of help get their brain to sort that out a little bit. Um, how effective is cognitive behavioral therapy on its own? About 48 to 53 percent at six months out for those who have had uh, uh, chronic post-traumatic stress. Um, a unique uh, therapy that I've come across is TRE or the shaking therapy. Um, this is a really interesting uh, therapy that um, a, a, a doctor developed as he was looking at the way people respond to things and animals. And he saw that this oftentimes following a traumatic experience, a child or an individual will shake and that shaking is part of releasing the trauma in their in their neurologic system. And I got to see that firsthand. Um, probably the some of the hardest things that I've seen in this world were, were my wife giving birth. And I have seven children. So I got to see that several times up close and, and personal. And and one of the things that always fascinated me was after going through such a difficult, um, traumatic uh, delivery process that her body would react uh, soon after the delivery and start shaking uncontrollably. And, and I believe that that process, um, as, as observed by the developers of the TRE, is part of getting rid of those excess um, trauma chemicals and getting the nervous system back into a healthier healing state. So they were able to identify certain postures, positions that could get the nervous system to shake being outside of a trauma moment, which would help the individual feel better about particular traumas that they'd been through. This is a, a really unique therapy. I think there's going to be more research coming out. Um, early early um, research that they're doing shows that it's quite effective in working with soldiers and, and others who have been through significant and sustained trauma. A few key components of neuroemotional technique. I'm not trained in this. Um, but it is a fascinating therapy and I've done some study on it. And many of you who are in this course um, will probably have much more in-depth training than I do. But it's based on the physiology of the emotional response. And it doesn't really treat emotions. This is a very important distinction because um, there are some legalities in that as well. But we're going after the emotional reality or the connection of the physiology of the body with the memory or reality of, of what a person might have gone through. That's important to understand. Um, and NET addresses the physical com complex in which an emotion and a related subluxations are components or parts. Um, I'm fascinated with this in part because I think it's one of the closest uh, emotional techniques that I've seen that involves much more of the uh, physical um, body and helping it to to change the way that it that the body reacts to a set of experiences or things that a person's been through and even that they may not even remember. Um, my goal today is to introduce a helpful set of techniques that I've come to understand that can be extremely helpful in getting an, an individual to break apart some of the trauma chemicals, the physical trauma chemicals that are that are established when a person goes through traumatic or difficult experiences. And um, it's a process that I've slowly been developing over the years. It's something that's helped me personally and helped other members of my family. Um, I'll give you one example. My my daughter uh, loves furry little animals, but somewhere along the way, she had developed a severe allergy to these furry little animals. And yet she wanted to be a veterinarian. Kind of hard to do when anything that you get up close and personal with causes a, a huge rash 
on any part of the body that they touch. Well, she had this condition going on, and we applied the principles of what I'm going to share with you um, over the next few minutes to that. And uh, within a couple of days at most, um, she was then able to handle and work with small little furry animals with no more problems, no more breaking out, no more uh, of that severe allergy response. So the things that I'm going to take you through in the next few minutes are really cool, but I want to make sure that you understand they're not a all in in all and by themselves a huge fix for all kinds of trauma. But any kind of work that you do with a client, if you want a safe process to be able to help them physiologically rewire and change the way their nervous system responds to that stress response. This is a great set of exercises that you can do safely for anybody that will enhance all other treatments that you're doing. I hope you like it. So here's our helpful little exercise. We had to give it a name. I called it trauma downregulation. I know I'm not very good at, uh, at coming up with cool names, but that's exactly what it does. It's a down-regulation process for the trauma ideation or the trauma processing. I call it trauma D for short. So what if you could in introduce a technique that will enhance the effectiveness of all the other therapies that you do? help you with the brain body patterns um, based in the anatomical physiology of past, present, and future connections to emotional responses. Sounds pretty good so far, right? Neuroplasticity interventions that will help improve mental and physical connections. Um, we've now been playing with this for oh, close to 10 years and have been improving the process to the point where I think it's ready to share with everybody. And, uh, let you all give us more feedback. So a little bit of the background. You need to, and, and you do realize this, especially in the functional neurology world, that there is a physiology of opposites. There's a right hemisphere versus the left hemisphere, a right eye versus left eye, a front versus back, ventral vagal versus dorsal vagal completely different in the way that uh, that they interact with the heart and, and all organs and, and brain, but they're both extremely important, right? There's a happy versus a sad. I think I've even got a little uh, um, emoticon that helps uh, explain that one. Excited versus indifferent, top versus bottom. What's this little image that I put on here? Uh, instantaneously, you should have said, well, it looks like she's curled up in the fetal position. So I started looking at some things and saying, okay, well, if that seems to be a protective response, that fetal position, what's the opposite of that? I think that you'll notice that everything in the fight or flight process is the opposite of curled up protection that we see in that uh, fetal position. Keep that in the back of your mind as we go through a few more things here. Oh, yes, there's a smiley, happy face, and it looks like his arches are sitting fairly well back there with the uvula. And uh, that's what we look like when we're in the opposite, right? <laughs> Important to look at. So a little bit of this trauma downregulation background. Um Looking further at these rules of opposites, the fight or flight is in complete opposition of the rest and digest. The fetal or protection system is a flexion versus the fight ready, which is an extension. The sharp intake of breath <gasps> versus when we're all safe. And doing a little bit of research, I find that, uh, you know, they've understood this concept for a long, long time in the ancient Chinese tradition. Um, the inhale is considered negative. <gasps> it's a yin. And the exhale considered a positive or the yang. Interesting how they balance each other out there, right? Um, well, does this extend to the sternocleidomastoid or to other anatomy? Is there a difference in fight or flight mechanism in a push versus a pull? 
What about our shoulder extensors, or our flexors? What about plantar flexion versus dorsiflexion? I met Dr. Edward Chauvin, um, an, an incredible uh, doctor, uh, chiropractic physician down in Louisiana, um, a quantum neurologist. Sometimes, sometimes these guys think on planes that I don't even understand. But he developed this uh, hummingbird technique. And as I was observing this technique, I thought, huh, he's got a bunch of things that he has also come to understand. They're a part of that uh, upregulation versus downregulation of the neurologic systems. And plantar flexion, which is often seen when a person's up on high heels, is part of that upregulation which is why in his technique, he puts you into that opposite. So this rule of opposites really goes back a long way, doesn't it? Let's go just a little bit further here and talk about hemisphericity to trauma. This is where I came to my aha moment. Are you going to put your best foot forward? And if you put your best foot forward, as you might for a track meet, does this tend to fire up the central nervous system or to calm down all the systems? And if that might be part of the case, there has to be this component that I've come to understand, and that is that trauma is written in dominant neurologic patterns. And I say dominant because they need to be ever-present the way our system is designed, those trauma patterns need to be ever present to help us keep from from being, uh, well, keep from being shut behind the door, right? So understanding that trauma is written in dominant neurologic patterns, this opens up the back door for treatment. I hope you like it. So if you position the body such that dominant patterns are minimized, it would be like this. If you're right-handed, you're going to put your right foot back. If you're right-handed, you're going to turn your body towards your right-hand side. You're going to kind of put it behind you or subservient behind your non-dominant side. Strap a calming haptic feedback generator. Um, that's my new name for uh, for this cool little tool called the uh, tuner. Um, but strap a calming haptic feedback pattern generator to the weaker leg or arm. Especially, I mean, if you're dealing with someone with CRPS, you might have to avoid certain parts of their body, right? But even people with CRPS and 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 other severe conditions can benefit from this process. So you strap it to the weaker arm or leg. Or maybe put it in a fanny pack and orient it to one side to provide billions of bits of carefully calibrated information through primarily non-dominant receptors. Um, these could be the Golgi tendon organs. They could be muscle receptors, joint receptors. Um, um, they could be the bones. Um, so, of course, we use the Resimax Tuner Pro 2 for that calming haptic feedback pattern generator. And uh, next, we engage neurotransmitters. The way that we do this is by bringing up memories, um, by thinking of a stress or a worry. And it could be from the past. It could be from the now. It could be from the future. We'll turn the head towards the dominant side, which elongates sternocleidomastoid on that side. The elongation of the sternocleidomastoid on that side helps you keep the chemicals at bay. You see, that muscle is such a big part of firing off that whole adrenaline and cortisol response. So if we elongate it, if we turn it to the side, now you might wonder where a lot of these things come from. But if you observe animals, when they're very dominant in fight or flight, they're straight on. But when they decide that this fight may not be the right one for me, they turn their heads and they show that that uh, they actually calm down some of those chemicals in their nervous system, which helps bring their brain back online a little bit. 
So some of the components of this have a lot of thought to them. And then we're going to um, put this, continue to put this together. We're going to squeeze or hold a ball or a pillow or pull on straps. Remember going back to those opposites? The pull seems to be an opposite of the push in the whole fight or flight process. So if you overlay this and just simply think about that fetal position as our protection position, all we're doing in these uh, various positions is um, putting an overlay of that fetal positioning protection mechanism into the movements dealing with trauma. And the next thing we do is just have a person breathe normally while engaging their core, while uh, engaging the abdominals, pushing hard into a ball, pushing from the hands, pushing from the legs, or pulling and engaging that core tremendously. We have them think about what fires them up. These could be past experiences, fears, concerns. Um, have them focus on one event or experience, and that's the very best. And then I have them take a big, sharp breath. Remember, that's part of the 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 um, fight or flight process, right? <gasps> a sharp inhalation. And then I lead a person through this process. We breathe out everything in the lungs, but in three distinct chunks. Through the nose with brief, brief pauses after breathing out. So the way I do this is like this. Take a big breath in. <gasps> breathe out. Stop but don't breathe in, breathe out, stop, but don't breathe in, breathe all the rest of the way out. It's really important during this phase that you help a person understand, don't breathe in during this little uh, pausing process. You focus on the exhale. Remember, that's the yang part of it. That's the calming response. Can you see what we're doing? We have them upregulate the system, put it into a position where it will help them calm down the system, and then have them go through a breathing pattern that further takes them into that calming. It's here where a really cool magic process happens. You see... At that point, when you're not holding any more breath in, part of your brain, your ancient reptilian brain, your amygdala, you know, all of your fear centers start screaming at you and saying, I don't know what you're doing, but I need air. But as long as you hold that point with no breath, as long as you can, safely, calmly, and you stop thinking about the trauma or worry while part of your brain is saying, breathe, breathe. And you're saying, no, I want to focus just a little bit longer on things that are more important to me. And I will have a person focus their mind on things that they're grateful for. Because everything that you're super grateful for takes your brain out of trauma mode and as you focus intently on it, it brings you into the present, the now, the sensations, the gratitude, and it explodes some cool neurotransmitters into your nervous system. Well, those neurotransmitters help your brain rewire the trauma response. Isn't that awesome? That's so cool. Well, after we've had them sit there for as long as they can without breathing in, and we've been sending billions and billions of bits of, of haptic feedback into their nervous system, especially through those non-dominant brain patterns, where we can create new loops that help their nervous system to be able to change the way it interacts with trauma and the things that they've been through or the worries and fears that they have of future days. We go ahead and have the person relax and say, breathe in big when you need to. And if they do that through the nose, um, it actually helps their nervous system say, I'm in a very calm state.
I have a person uh, go ahead and repeat that exercise seven times. By the time they've gone through that rep, that seven repetitions of these exercises, and I'll show it to you in just a minute, um, they do it once a day. That's about five minutes a day. They do that for at least six days a week and then give themselves a break for a day. And six weeks of doing this six days a week um, makes a world of difference for those who have been going through an awful lot. So I thought that it would be most helpful to bring an extremely difficult case in front of you and have you see that process in action. Are you ready? I'd like to introduce um, a young lady from the Netherlands that is over here going through an intensive treatment at a facility called Cognitive FX in uh, Provo, Utah. And she's got a very severe condition. She'll uh, explain that to you in a minute. But for those of you who may not be able to understand her accent, she has a condition called rumination syndrome that occurred after a workplace accident where she took a hit to the head. Um, so we're dealing with brain trauma. We're also dealing with um, the psychological component and everything else in this rumination syndrome. If you're not familiar with it, it's a condition where your brain decides that everything that comes into your stomach is an attack on your central nervous system. So those who have this, they put food in, that food comes right back out. And it's a terribly painful process. But I'm going to let... Uh, let our friend Angel go ahead and talk to you a little bit more about this. Uh, six years ago, I had an accident, a company accident. I got a case to my head and I got tried a brain injury. And since then, I vomit all day. Uh, in the beginning, I didn't know what it was. And after four years, uh, they make a diagnosis of rumination syndrome. Okay, so we're going to put the uh, device on the, uh, on the leg. We're going to strap the uh, device uh, strap the uh, strap to a tree or to a uh, door anything that makes it uh, simple feet back so you're gonna go turn towards your dominant side you're gonna rotate your head towards that side you're gonna drop your hips back like you're pulling that tree towards you and in that positioning we engage the abdominal muscles and i want a lot of your focus on what you feel right there as you go through this okay okay so as she's pulling, as she's pulling with all her might, go ahead and pull, let's see those muscles pop out. I want you to now go ahead and think about, let's bring back a trauma that you'd like to work on today. I want one that's at least a 10 on your Richter scale. So I want you pulling with all your might, thinking about anything that you went through with that particular thing. Where you were, time of day, time of year, sights, sounds, smells, uh, words that you heard, voices, you know, anything at all that lights up your memory. Take a deep breath in, big breath in, breathe out, stop, breathe out, stop, breathe out, all the rest of the way. When you get completely out of air, focus on those things you're super, super, super grateful for, pulling with all your might, and breathe in when you have to, and relax completely when you have to feels good. That's a very good exercise for that. Okay, so it's the same concept. This leg goes back a little bit, that leg goes, so you're turning towards this right side, but you're engaging by pushing down for all that you're worth, trying to get those abdominals to even shake a little bit. Big breath in when you're ready. Nice work. Wow. This one was long. Yeah. Huh. It's a lot harder when your whole body is engaged in that pulling. Yeah. Because you've got all these muscles screaming for oxygen too. Now, you're concentrating more. So this is, you know, there are some times that you'll want to do it this way. Oh, it's sometimes. releasing. Whew. And sometimes you'll want to do it using the tree. So the squeezing of the ball and the digging in of the legs that really engages your core. This one is like just squeezing the bejeebers out of that thing, okay? Man, this is tough. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you're gonna keep that yeah. squeeze yeah. just as hard and as long as you can 
while you're going through the process of thinking, breathing out, keep that squeeze. Think of all the things you're super grateful for when you're, uh, or forgiveness when you're done, then you can let go of the ball and relax, okay? Excellent. <sighs>
And the transformation had started to occur. Um, she was much more calm. She could talk to you about the things that she'd been through without um, exploding with them. It wasn't but a few months later that she got up in front of a, a group of a few thousand people and talked about the experience without having to relive the chemicals of the whole thing. We were able to help her change her nervous system so that it could function in daily life and no more worrying about the kids when she took them to school. We're able to help that uh, change dramatically, that trauma response. But that's how I understood um, that you can choose the wrong side. It's not going to hurt a person. It's just that you're going to notice they're going to be irritable, cranky, uh, frustrated, maybe scream a lot, maybe cry more. So let's not do that. Let's make sure that we use their dominant side to have them orient this exercise too. Um, so how do you choose that? I go down to the simplest of simple things. I don't care if they use both hands for all kinds of things or dominant eye or any of that. Ask them, which side do you brush your teeth with? And 99.8%, maybe 99.9% .9 of people tell me they will only brush their teeth with one hand. So I choose that side. That's the dominant side. And then I don't worry about the rest of it. And the exercise seems to work for nearly everybody. Um, the next question, I'm ambidextrous. How do I know which side to choose? Again, go back to that toothbrush thing. That's always a uh, great one. Um, what is, which is the best between sitting, ball, or strap exercise? And it really does depend. And it depends on the individuals. We've had people in their 80s and 90s perform this exercise. We won't do it with a strap for them. We'll do it with the ball or a couple of pillows all bunched up in their lap and have them do it in sitting. But a few things that we've found that people have told us, if a lot of their experiences are in the sad or lonely range, using that ball is extremely helpful or using a couple of pillows and having them just squeeze that. It's like a, it's like a huge hug. And squeezing really seems to help when people have a lot of the sad or lonely. If they've had um, good or bad experiences with a rope or a pillow, you know, maybe someone held a pillow against their face for way too long, and so they're tra traumatized by that. Or we had one individual that said, you know, I can't use a rope because when I was at my worst, I, you know, I tried several times to commit suicide and I used a rope and I just, I can't use a rope without bringing too much of that back. So we just avoid those things for somebody that's, you know, been traumatized by a pillow or, or, or by a strap. Um, the other, uh, another question that we get is, um, does it matter where I put the devices? And, Mostly we try and orient them on the non-dominant side of the body, but sometimes after a person's been doing the exercise for a while, we'll also put one on their dominant side. Remember, the brain has both ways and lots of connections, right? Once a person's really come to understand the exercise, we can add in variation that will help them complete a bigger picture for their brain. And then what do I do if I don't have a cool haptic feedback device uh, for neurologic training like a tuner? Well, we used to do this exercise without uh, these devices. It takes a little bit longer and it's not as uh, fast to rebuild those brain connections, but it certainly works. So start wherever you are. Um, this is a great thing to add into any type of program that you're already doing. Next question, what do I do when whatever I was thinking about is no longer an issue? And um, one of the things, if you get a chance to go into our booth and see some of the other videos with, uh, with our friend there, she took a number of issues that were a 12 on the Richter scale off the charts down to a zero. And we do that, we see that with people all the time. And once they bring it down to where the emotional charge is gone out of the situation, then move to another one. If you're like most of us, we have a lifetime of experiences that we can draw from, that we can, uh, that we can do this with, right? 
like the time that I made a mistake and wet my pants in fourth grade. You know, those are things that super embarrassing at the time, charged my nervous system. I wouldn't tell anybody about that stuff except for I no longer have an emotional attachment to it. So I can share my uh, my old secrets with you. So does it have to be? Oh, wait, did I miss something? Let's see. Oh, yeah. What do I do after six weeks? I tell people, take at least a week off. And then if you still feel a lot of emotional charge with things that you've been through, go through it again. For most individuals, they go through that process a couple of times and they feel transformed in the way that their nervous system reacts to traumatic experiences, which definitely helps all of your other therapies be more effective, right? Take the tension out of that system. Can I combine trauma thoughts with other emotion, with another emotion such as sad? Actually, you don't even have to think about a traumatic experience. You can just think about how you feel in an emotion, what those sensations and feelings are like, break them apart, help a person reorganize them. By the way, when does their nervous system or their brain reorganize itself after these exercises? It takes about one to two sleep cycles. So right now, you may be able to take an item that was a 12 down to a zero, but your brain will actually reconstruct that thing over the next 24 to 48 hours and change it even further. So it's kind of a fun process. Does it have to be a trauma? No, absolutely not. It can be a worry. It can be a fear. Do I really need to breathe in or out through my nose? We found something, and that is that breathing in through your mouth kind of goes back into that trauma ideation that trauma thinking, that trauma experience. And so if you can um, do a little bit more breathing through the nose, it keeps those pressures higher in your brain and keeps you into more of a calm state. It's kind of like humming to our device. It's a way of getting the nervous system to stay in that calming state while going through that. Those are a few of the frequently asked questions. I hope you'll have more questions because I would love to answer those if you uh, and, and and think of the uh, solutions for you when we do. Now, one of the things that you'll notice is that we had a little uh, strap on our head. Um, this is a sponsor of this event. These guys are absolutely amazing. I got a chance to uh, meet with the inventors of the Focus Band over in Australia earlier this year. And we've been doing some research with them. I think that this um, this little EEG on the go device is going to help tremendously in the days to come for a lot of reasons. But um, it's it's cool. You're going to see their presentation. I'm not going to give you a lot of uh, details. I will tell you I've been experimenting with this thing for six months, and it works, and it can uh, it can help an individual come to understand their brainwave activity during function, which is absolutely revolutionary. Those of us who have you know, gone through an EEG, um, it, it, it's kind of hard to sit there for that long and, and keep your brain from moving very much. And, and then it's mighty hard to read those things. Well, this is where the rubber meets the road and simplicity is demonstrated. I also love that... Um, They've been doing some research. You'll see in the bottom left corner there that um, we are being able to demonstrate some of the benefits of that calming haptic neurofeedback device called the tuner. Um, it's really neat that we can actually introduce it and watch brain waves change as function improves. I think you're all going to like that. Um, just a little bit more about that. It's a great way to be able to see exactly where you're at in real time. And you can apply some uh, vagus nerve stimulation or other rehabilitation uh, interventions and watch the plasticity in the nervous system. It's a gauge for neuroplasticity. So I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Now, I've watched a uh, couple of other uh, um 
great instructors. And I noticed that the really good instructors make sure that you understood the key points of the presentation before they finish. So let's go over a few. Which of the following are key components of cognitive behavioral therapy? And if you looked at those and said, huh, it looks like all of them, you'd be right on. And number two, which of the following are not considered physiologic responses to an acute stress event? Well, let's see. Yes, it does increase the heart rate. Definitely increases cortisol. Uh, limited nutrient absorption and decreased hunger. Yep, those are key components. Must be something about the breathing, huh? When a person is in that acute stress response, they definitely don't know how to do the deep breathing. Which of the following is not a component of the fight, flight, freeze states of the nervous system? Well, let's see. Jaw tensing certainly is. Increasing blood pressure certainly is. Difficulty sleeping certainly is. Digestive problems certainly are. It must be that last one. I'm guessing that um, there's no time to think about that stuff in the uh, whole intimacy arena when the fight, flight, freeze states are running rampant in the nervous system. Oh, well, there is one more, two more. What are the components of zero point breathing? That's where we take a large breath, hold the breath as long as you can. No, that upregulates the system. Exhale and immediately take a large breath and hold as long as you can? No. Again, holding the breath is part of the upregulation of the central nervous system. Breathing naturally, that's good. But focusing on the interval between exhalation and before taking the next breath creates a cool, I call it a vacuum in the central nervous system where you can introduce thoughts of gratitude, thoughts of forgiveness, thoughts of of Future building, maybe a prayer to your maker, telling them how grateful you are to survive the hard things that you've been through. That is the coolest thing ever is that you can focus on that interval between exhalation and before taking the next breath and change your central nervous system. And number five, true or false, the fetal position is an instinct or reflex reaction to extreme stress or trauma. Absolutely. We curl into a ball, don't we? Just want to remind you, I have a wonderful crew. You can come out here to uh, Utah and meet us anytime. Or if you happen to be at some shows, I get a, sometimes I'll get a family member to come with me and, uh, and help demonstrate some of our uh, tuners and hope you get to meet them all through time. They're a fun crew. And uh, just one last little thing. Thank you, uh, Dr. Trayford for sharing your lecture that you did at a seminar we put on earlier this year. But I love this little saying from, uh, from Dr. Trayford. He sent me this note one day and I, I love to look at it often. Thank you for your contribution to this world. I see your invention as a musical instrument. The more I play it, the more I see its complexities and potential. I just want you to know, those of you who have stayed with us this long, there's going to be some even more cool things coming out in the next couple of months that you don't want to miss. That's enough for now. Thank you.